Welcome to the history of Rome. In a single generation, Rome had recovered from the devastation of the Gallic sack and regained its dominant position within the region. The plebes had demanded and received greater political power, culminating with the election of the first plebe consul in 366 BC, the year after Camilla shepherded the Licinian law through the Senate. I did not mention this last week, but the admittance of plebes into the consulship also saw the end of military tribunes with consular power as one of the highest offices of state. The dual consulship was reinstated for good, and the obsolete office of military tribune was never revived. Subsequent years would see other plebe firsts, including the first plebe dictator in 356 BC and the first plebe censor in 351 BC. Both feats achieved by a single man, Gaius Martius Rutulus, who, over the course of his illustrious career, would also be elected consul four times. By 343 BC, the Romans were once again seen as the great force in central Italy, and, as we are about to see, this meant that their neighbors forever sought to involve them in squabbles that had nothing to do with Rome or Roman interests. The Romans were the big kid on the block every other kid wanted on their side. As I did last time, I would like to open this week with a quote from Livy, discussing the year hostilities began with the Samnites, and its significance in the greater arc of Roman history. From now on, the wars described will be of greater importance. Our enemies were more powerful, and campaigns lasted longer and were mounted in remote areas. For this was the year when an attack was launched against the Samnites, a people who were strong both in resources and in arms. After the Samnite War, which was inconclusive, Pyrrhus was the enemy, and after him, the Carthaginians. What a series of momentous events. How often we were in mortal danger to enable us to raise up our empire to its present heights of grandeur, where only with difficulty it is sustained. Rome was on the precipice of its rise to greatness. The Samnites, as I've said previously, were a semi-nomadic tribe from the south-central section of the Apennines called Samnium. Starting in the 300s BC, the Samnites, along with a number of other hill tribes, began to come down out of the hills and onto the plains that lay between the mountains and the coastline. Some moved south and began to encroach on the Greek cities of Magna Graecia. Others, like the Samnites, began to move west and came down to a land known as Campania, which lay southeast of Rome. The Greeks in the south sent envoys across the Adriatic to beg for assistance in fighting off the hill tribes and were answered by Alexander of Epirus, who sent an army to help rid the Greeks of the encroaching menace. As we will see later, this introduction of an army from Epirus would have far-reaching consequences for the Romans. Sixty years later, an army from Epirus would again answer Greek calls for aid, only this time not to battle nomadic hill tribes, but rather the growing power of Rome. But we still have a ways to go before we get to that. The largest and most important city in Campania, where the Samnites were setting up shop, was Capua. Known for its rich soil and soft lifestyle, Capua was no match for the hardened Samnite warriors, so, like the Greeks, they cast about for a savior. Envoys were sent to the largest and strongest power in the region, Rome, to beg for aid. The Romans, however, turned the envoys away. Rome had already concluded a treaty with the Samnites and could not in good conscience break it. They had, after all, sworn oaths before the gods. The desperate Capuans then took an extraordinary step. They formally surrendered Capua, its land and citizens, to Rome, willingly making themselves subjects of Rome. The Senate could not look this massive gift horse in the mouth. The land controlled by Capua was some of the best in Italy, and the food it could provide would put the days of grain famine in the rearview mirror forever. The Romans accepted the surrender and sent their own envoys to Samnium, where they explained that Capua was now Roman territory and, as per their treaty, the Samnites must desist all attacks. The Samnites would have none of this and scoffed at the Roman envoys, taking the insulting step of ordering a raid into Campania right in front of the Roman legates. The Romans, offended by this obvious breach of protocol, felt they had no choice at this point but to declare war. And so the first Samnite war began. The two consuls for that year, 343 B.C. by our reckoning, were Aulus Cornelius Cassus, a capable but forgettable leader, and Marcus Valerius Corvus, a true blue member of the legendary Roman Heroes Club. He was a member of the prominent Valerian family, whose famous ancestral patriarch was Publius Valerius Publicola himself. The surname Corvus, or Raven, was earned as a young man while serving in the army. 
the legions were squaring off against an army of Gauls when a huge Gallic fighter stepped forward and challenged any Roman to single combat. Young Marcus Valerius, all of twenty-two, stepped forward and accepted the challenge. As he approached the Gaul, a raven landed on his shoulder, a sign that the gods favored him. The Gaul was worried by this clear omen, but proceeded with the fight anyway, and the raven, far from leaving when the clash began, actually joined in, pecking at the Gaul's eyes while Valerius ran him through with his sword. Valerius triumphant, the raven flew off. The legions then swept into the Gallic line and defeated them almost without resistance, an auspicious, if obviously embellished, beginning to a career to say the least. Corvus would be elected consul for the first time the very next year at the unprecedented age of 23. Before dying at the also unprecedented age of 100, he would be elected consul five more times and named dictator twice. But getting back to the war with the Samnites, Corvus was sent to protect Campania and his colleague Cossus was sent to invade Samnium. Between the two, they figured to have the Samnites at heel in no time. Corvus was the first to meet the enemy and after a fierce battle at the base of Mount Garus, fiercer than the Romans expected, the Samnites were routed. It was not an easy victory, and put the Romans on notice that they were not fighting Volscian raiders anymore. Cossus, in Samnium, almost blundered his way into the destruction of his own army, but was saved by one of his tribunes. The consul had led his army into a ravine, and noticed only too late that the Samnites had taken up a position on the ridge and stood ready to shower them with projectiles. One of his tribunes, Publius Decius, noticed that the Samnites were positioned in the shadows of a steep hill, and if a company of Romans could take the hill, then they would be able to pin down the Samnites, allowing the legions to escape. Cossus immediately ordered Decius and a detachment of volunteers to execute the plan. Decius slipped up and took the hill before the Samnites realized what was going on, and immediately began pelting the Samnites with missiles. In the confusion, Cossus was able to withdraw his army to safety but Decius was left on the hill, surrounded by an army of angry Samnites who had just been denied an easy victory. Secure on the high ground, the Roman detachment was able to hold out until nightfall, at which point, recognizing their hopeless position, they decided to risk death by sneaking through the Samnite army rather than remaining on the hill and safely starving to death. They had gone about halfway through the camp when one of the soldiers dropped his shield on a sleeping Samnite. Decius immediately began yelling at his men to attack anything that moved. The Samnites, half asleep and panicked by the sudden violent commotion, did not know what or who to attack. Decius and his men made a break through the army, killing everything in their path. When they emerged on the other side, Decius took a head count and realized to his great pleasure that of the company of men he had led on a sure suicide mission, he had not lost a single man. In the morning they made their way to the Roman camp, and were greeted to thunderous applause. Costas was about to launch into a speech praising Decius when the tribune cut him off, saying that the Samnites were in complete disarray and the time to finish the job was now. Costas took the advice and sent his army out. The Romans found the Samnites exactly as Decius had described, in confused disarray, attacked them immediately, and won easily. The Romans had now won their first two engagements with the Samnites, but the first had been an unexpectedly hard slog, and the latter would have been a disaster had it not been for the tactical blunder the Samnites had committed by not immediately falling on Costas' legions. The third and final battle of the war was fought at Susula, near the border between Campania and Samnium. Envoys from that city came to Marcus Corvus with news that the army he had driven off was regrouping and planning to reinvade. Corvus ordered his army forward with all haste, leaving behind all non-essential personnel and gear, marching only with his infantry, cavalry, and what could be carried on their backs. This decision to pack light would prove, unexpectedly, to be the decisive factor in the coming fight. When Corvus arrived at Susula, he ordered a camp built. Due to the paucity of men and material, the camp turned out to be physically much smaller than the Samnites were used to seeing the Romans build. They assumed this meant that a smaller force was encamped, and all their strategic decisions flowed from this faulty assumption. They decided that the best course would be to starve the small Roman garrison out and began preparing for a siege. The Samnite commanders, rather than keeping their army together, ordered foraging parties out across the countryside for supplies to sustain their army while they waited for the Romans to surrender. Corvus caught wind of the Samnite activities 
and, as soon as the bulk of the army was scattered, he ordered his men to attack. The Samnites were shocked when the whole of the legions came pouring out of the small camp, not the minor detachment they had supposed they were dealing with. Corvus's army took the Samnite camp almost without a fight, and then spent the rest of the afternoon rounding up the dispersed Samnite foraging parties. The Battle of Sisula was over before it had really begun. This victory marked the end of the First Samnite War. Corvus and Cossus were both awarded triumphs, and Decius was given the grass crown for his heroics. The grass crown was the most prestigious and rarely given military honor, the highest decoration a Roman soldier could receive. It was given to an individual who single-handedly, or nearly single-handedly, saved an entire legion from destruction. It was a rare honor because it was granted only by a vote of the saved legionnaires themselves, and it took extraordinary circumstances for proud Roman soldiers to admit that they had to be rescued. But in this case it was universally understood that Decius had saved their butts, so Decius got the grass crown. After the fighting ended, however, the Romans were forced to deal with trouble from an unexpected source, their own legions. During the winter of 342-341 BC, the legions were garrisoned across Campania to keep an eye out for further Samnite aggression. The largest garrison was outside of Capua, the city famous for its soft, easy living and detrimental effect on military discipline. Indeed, as we would later see, some note a marked change in the power and endurance of Hannibal's army after spending the winter in Capua during the Second Punic War. The Roman garrison, cooped up for the winter in camp, looked on at the comfortable Capuans and began asking themselves why a people who could not even defend themselves were allowed to have so much when they, the soldiers who had secured the peace, were given so little. The consuls for that year began to hear mutinous rumors coming from the Campanian legions and took steps to nip the conspiracy in the bud, but the move backfired. Their plan was to quietly reassign the men identified as conspirators and shuffle groups of soldiers around so no hard plans could be laid. But the conspirators quickly caught on and, rather than reporting to their new assignments, they collected at an arranged point and began to actively plot a rebellion. They were soon strong enough numbers-wise but lacked a leader to make them a cohesive unit. In a classic display of counterproductive ego and pride, nobody was willing to submit to the command of anyone else, so they remained a body without a head. As they brainstormed for ways out of their dilemma, it was noted that an ex-general, Titus Quintius, lived in the area. Quintius had retired fully from public life, despising the backstabbing intrigue of Roman politics, and the conspirators decided he was the perfect choice to lead them. A company of men was sent to persuade the old man to join their cause. Quintius, however, wanted nothing to do with the mutinous rabble, but was persuaded when the men threatened to kill him and his whole family if he did not come along. Having successfully hijacked a leader, the revolt moved forward, and the men marched towards Rome, though what exactly they hoped to accomplish is unclear. They probably wanted to secure land grants in Campania, but how they thought the Senate, or the people of Rome, would simply give them what they wanted and then go on as if nothing happened is a mystery. The rebellion had taken on an irrational inertia all its own. Upon hearing the news that a rebellious army was marching on Rome, the Senate immediately named Marcus Corvus to the first of his two dictatorships, and he rode off at the head of a legion to stop the mutinous army. They met each other at the Alban Mount, near the birthplace of Romulus and Ramus, but neither side was destined to draw their swords in anger. Instead, the occasion was defined by reconciliation and secured Corvus's place in the history books not just as a great warrior, but also a wise and compassionate leader of men. He was loved not just by the men he led that day, but also by the mutineers, most of whom had fought with him against the Samnites. Corvus implored them to put down their swords and not draw the blood of their fellow citizens. Quintius, the hijacked general, who wanted no part of the rebellion anyway, ordered his men to stand down, and the combined weight of these two towering figures compelled them to give up. Corvus then led a combined force back into Rome, where he famously asked for and received clemency for the rebellious soldiers. Corvus did not want the affair to remain a thorn in the side of Roman solidarity, and he made sure no soldier was cast off the census rolls or in any other way penalized for his actions. It was a singular case of leniency toward mutinous soldiers, and, though Corvus was hailed forever as a great man for securing the leniency, 
His example was rarely followed by later generations, who treated any hint of mutiny quickly and without mercy. Soon after the abortive rebellion, a truce was formalized with the Samnites. The Campanians, however, were in no mood for peace, and allied themselves with a combined Latin army that took the fight into Samnium as a punitive response to the Samnite invasion of Campania. The Latin communities hoped to grab some Samnite land and enhance their own power in the region, hopefully securing better terms of alliance with Rome. The Samnites immediately appealed to the Romans to halt the attacks. The Romans agreed to order the Campanians, who were now their subjects, to halt, but claimed their treaty with the Latins granted them no authority over their own internal military decisions. And this decision had two effects. For one, it offended the Samnites, who thought the Romans were just hiding behind legalese and directing the Latins, subjects to Rome in all but name, to keep fighting illegally after the treaty had been established. Second, it perked the ears of the Latins, who took the Roman decision to mean that the Romans did not believe they could stop the Latins from what they were doing. The time was ripe, the Latins decided, to renegotiate their status with Rome. For over a hundred years, they had sent men and money to fight Roman wars and were consistently given only a pittance of the spoils in return. Full equality, they decided, was theirs for the taking, and, turning away from the Samnites, they set their sights on Rome itself. Having just concluded one war, the Romans were about to be embroiled in another, the Latin War, which would not turn out exactly as the Latins planned, resulting in not full equality, but full subservience to Roman rule, and an end even to the appearance of independence. The first Samnite war would prove to be mere foreplay between the Samnites and Romans. The Romans had gotten the upper hand, but it could have just as easily gone the other way. The second, or Great Samnite War, would start 20 years later and not last for two years, but 22 years. In that war, the Samnites would hand the Romans some of their greatest and most humiliating defeats. The Romans had, since their founding, used the Greek phalanx system for their army, but soon found it unsuited for the mountainous terrain of Samnium. The Samnite cavalry and light infantry were able to easily outmaneuver the heavy Roman phalanx, forcing the Romans to completely overhaul their military structure before they could beat the Samnites in the field. But that war was still a generation away. Next week, the Romans will follow the old adage that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and join forces with the Samnites to quash forever Latin dreams of independence. first Samnite war had been inconclusive. Yes, the Romans had gotten the better of it in battle, but nothing resembling a definitive conclusion was reached. The Samnites seemed content to consolidate their gains and not press the issue, and the Romans were disinclined to take the fight to the next level. They had done right by their allies and driven the Samnites out of Campania. They had no interest for now in invading Samnium and trying to conquer a strong-willed, capable, and well-supplied army. Plus, the winds of discontent were blowing in from Latium, and the Romans knew full well that if they got entangled with the Samnites, the Latin communities would be in a strong position to leverage concessions from the Romans. So a treaty of peace was concluded between the Romans and Samnites. The Latins saw this as a tacit admission of weakness, and, seeking a more personally beneficial arrangement with the Romans, decided to strike while the iron was hot. But before any sort of conflict with the Latins were joined, a further step was taken in the Publian, thanks to John for correcting my pronunciation, quest for a greater share in power. In 342 BC, not long after the mutiny of the garrison soldiers in Campania, the plebes pushed through another set of reforms that solidified their power. The package included the important provision that one of the consuls for each year not just could be a plebe, but had to be a plebe. But more importantly, it set the well-known and off-sided requirement that ten years must pass before a man could hold the same office twice. The move was designed, obviously, to prevent one man from gaining too much power, 
but at times the cure was worse than the disease, especially, for example, during the Second Punic War, when it became nearly impossible to run the war when the leadership kept changing. So though the tenure requirement was followed and disregarded according to circumstance, it did set a cultural precedent strong enough that when, between 104 and 100 BC, Gaius Marius was elected consul five times in a row, it was a scandal that engendered enough ill will that the social fabric of the state began to unravel. But that is for a much later date, probably sometime early next year at the pace we're going. When the Romans withdrew from fighting the Samnites, the Campanians and Latins both wanted to carry on with the fight. As I mentioned last week, the Samnites implored the Romans to put a stop to the aggression, but the Romans refused to order the Latins to do anything one way or the other. The Latins immediately took this to mean that if Rome did not feel strong enough to enforce its will, politics being the zero-sum game that it is, then that meant the Latins must be stronger than their supposed masters. They resolved to use this to their advantage. A delegation representing the Latin League was sent to Rome to demand a political reordering. Up to this point, the Latins had enjoyed varying degrees of Roman citizenship, usually trade and intermarriage rights, stopping short of full suffrage. The delegation asked of the Romans not just full suffrage, but also audaciously demanded that one of the two yearly consuls come from the Latin communities. The Romans were shocked and practically laughed the delegation out of the Senate. No Roman was going to submit himself to the rule of a mere Latin. The plebes had just guaranteed their own consulship and weren't about to give it up, while the patricians had just given up one of their consulships and weren't about to let go of the other. On the question of a Latin consul, the two classes were united. The Senate's, and I'm paraphrasing here, answer to the Latin delegation was, no, no, there will be no political reordering. We like things just the way they are, thank you very much. Do you not remember that we wiped the floor with you at Lake Regillus, and that's why things are the way they are? If you really want what you're asking for, then come take it, if you can. The Senate then immediately voted for war to teach the impertinent Latins a lesson. Legions were raised and sent out to meet the Latin force that had been massing in anticipation of the Senate's rejection of Latin demands. The consuls for that year were Titus Manlius Torquatus and our old friend and hero of the first Samnite War, Publius Decius, he of the grass crown. On a brief tangent, the Romans dated the past by reference to the consuls for a given year rather than by an arbitrary numbering system, so that, for example, last week's battles with the Samnites were said to have taken place in the consulship of Corvus and Cossus rather than in, say, 167, dating from the founding of the Republic, or 409, dating from the founding of the city. It seems a bit unwieldy to us, but the Romans liked it just fine. Down the road, the system of reference would lead to the Roman joke that events occurring in the year of Julius Caesar's consulship, 59 BC, took place not in the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, but in the consulship of Julius and Caesar. Get it? The Romans could be a laugh riot when the mood struck. Anyway, in the consulship of Decius and Manlius, 340 BC by our reckoning, war with the Latins began. In the beginning, the outcome was very much in doubt. It had been years since the Romans had fought an enemy that so evenly matched them. It was almost like facing a mirror. The Romans and Latin forces were nearly identical in size. They used all the same tactics, spoke the same language, prayed to the same gods, and in most cases knew each other personally. There would not be any surprises or innovative tactics, just a standard straight-ahead infantry battle and victory to the strongest or luckiest. Both sides knew it, and new heavy casualties loomed as force pitted itself against force. Two legends emerged from the war, one revealing how the Romans were able to win a fight that seemed destined to produce a draw, the second hammering home the idea that obeying consular authority is paramount and the only way to maintain the critical discipline required for Rome to defeat its enemies. The first legend states that after the legions had built their camp near the Latin force and settled in for the night, both consuls had the same dream. In it, an apparition revealed that in the coming battle, the victorious side would sacrifice its commander, while the losing side would sacrifice its whole army. When they awoke, the two conferred and realized that they had had the same dream. They made a pact that each would lead one flank of the army, and whichever side began to fail first, that consul would charge into the enemy and seek death 
so the gods would grant their whole army victory. The second legend states that the consul Manlius had given orders to his troops that no one should engage the Latins until he had given the okay. He wanted the battle to start at the time and place of his choosing and didn't want reckless brawling to spark a battle he wasn't prepared for. Manlius's son Titus, however, disobeyed the order while leading a cavalry detachment on patrol. They encountered a group of Latins and Titus was challenged to single combat by one of them. Titus demurred, understanding his orders, but the Latins called him a coward and all sorts of other nasty names. His hackles raised, Titus accepted and proceeded to kill his challenger. Returning to camp with the spoils taken from his dead enemy, Titus was greeted by cheers, but the festive atmosphere died under the withering stare of his father, who ordered his son arrested. Manlius gave a brief speech in which he defended what he was about to do. His family, he said, would be torn apart by the punishment he was about to hand down, but that was far better than having the entire state torn apart by disobedience to consular authority. Then, without compassion and to the horror of his men, Manlius ordered his own son flogged and beheaded. Titus was given a hero's burial, and the army, from that point on, hated their commander, but it was, to Manlius's credit, a far more disciplined and professional army that was doing the hating than before. There is nothing new about either of these legends, and they are both retreads of previous stories. Those of you who know Greek history will recognize the familiar elements of King Leonidas' vision that Sparta must either lose a king or its freedom to the Persians, which led him to make his suicidal last stand at Thermopylae to save his city. And those of you who have followed this podcast will note that Manlius' decision to execute his own son follows closely the story of the consul Brutus and his treasonous sons from the early days of the Republic. Roman analysts were enamored with the idea that Romans of the past displayed a dedication to the state that had fallen out of fashion and needed to be rekindled. To the later Romans, just as it is today and in most other times and places, the past became bathed in the golden light of simple nobility and selfless virtue, whether or not any such thing was true. Legends aside, there was a battle, and it did take place, near the base of Mount Vesuvius. Yes, that Mount Vesuvius. The Latins and Romans lined up for battle, and the fight was joined, with Decius leading the left flank and Manlius leading the right. The fighting was intense and evenly matched, but soon the Roman left began to buckle under the weight of the Latin advance. Supposedly, Decius, knowing what he must do, donned a ceremonial purple-tinged toga and veiled his face. Then, fully armed, he mounted his horse and charged into the opposing line. The Latins were at first terrified at the appearance of this mad, masked horseman, and Decius killed not an insignificant number before he was finally taken down by a shower of spears. Manlius, watching his colleague fall, knew that victory was within his grasp. He held back a reserve of veteran soldiers, and, when the Latins were worn down, Manlius sent in the fresh troops and the Latins broke. Returning to Rome, it is said that Manlius was greeted with acclaim by the older men, but shunned by the young, who hated him for executing Titus, a well-liked young noble. And whether it was Decius' sacrifice or Manlius' tactics, the Latins were beaten. Over the course of the next year and a half, the Romans pursued a policy of laying siege to each of the Latin cities one by one, dividing them so none could offer aid to any of the others. It was during this stage of the war that the Samnites provided auxiliary forces to the Roman effort joining the two enemies briefly under the same banner. It was in both of their interests to put down the rising Latins before the Roman Samnite battle for Italian supremacy really got going. No sense in having some third-party wild card in the mix. They both agreed on that. Some of the Latin cities surrendered at the sight of the Roman army. Some resisted a little and then gave up, and some fought to the bitter end. When it was over, Rome had subdued the entirety of Latium. At this point, the Latin League was abolished once and for all, and any independent Latin identity was destroyed forever. In the aftermath, the Senate gathered and decided the fate of each Latin tribe on a case-by-case -case basis. Those who gave up quickly or never joined the rebellion were given full Roman citizenship. Those who resisted some were allowed to keep intermarriage and trade rights, but denied the vote, while those who led the revolt were turned off their land and their holdings were colonized by Roman citizens. 
This treatment of the Latins was typical of Roman official policy. Anyone who was predisposed to friendship and did not resist Roman rule was welcomed openly into the empire and given an array of rights and privileges, while those predisposed to hostility and resistance were simply wiped off the map. Most nations and tribes fell into the former camp and found themselves well treated by their new Roman overlords. It was this policy of generosity that secured the longevity of the ethnically diverse empire. That, and the ruthless extermination of those tribes and nations who fell into the latter camp. The stage is now set for one of the most important wars in Roman history, the Second or Great Samnite War. It is comparable in historical importance to the Second Punic War, which saw the Romans defeat Carthage, and the Macedonian Wars, which brought Greece under Roman control. In the Second Samnite War, the Romans, for the first time, set themselves on a course of conscious expansion with an eye on winning a far-reaching empire. It was a decades-long fight, and the Romans nearly lost a number of times, but when it was over, Rome found itself in control of all Italy. But before we get into all that, I want to pause and give a fuller account of the Roman legion, how it fought, how it operated, and how it was commanded. The Samnite Wars marked a period of transition for the army, and this is a good time to take a look at how the Romans had fought in the past and how they would fight in the future. The strategy and tactics and formation of the legion would remain in place for the next 200 odd years until Marius came along and reorganized it yet again. And I want you to have a good picture in your mind of what things looked like as we move forward because it will allow you to visualize the battles of the upcoming Punic Wars better and later to fully understand why the Romans were able to so decisively defeat the Greeks. So next week we will learn about the phalanx, its strengths and weaknesses, and why the Romans scrapped it in favor of the maniple system, how many men a centurion really led, hint, the answer is not a hundred, and what the word legion actually means. one of the most basic questions about Rome. Why was it able to control so much territory for so long? One need look no further than the Roman legion. There were myriad secondary reasons, competent hands-off administration, sound economic policies, and superior engineering skills. But at the beginning and end of the day, it was the legion that secured the longevity of Rome. No fighting force matched it in the ancient world. But its dominance was not the result of finding a perfect method of organizing and leading men and then sticking to that static model forever. Rather, the Romans constantly tinkered, rearranged, and improved the legions, depending on circumstances. One of the great virtues of Rome, and one the Romans themselves took immense pride in, was their ability to learn from their own mistakes and adopt the superior methods of their enemies. When I was in college, I took a course in ancient political theory where we studied Plato and Aristotle, the Sophists, and other Greek thinkers. But when we got to the Romans, apart from some cursory reading of Cicero and Marcus Aurelius, my professor spent the class periods teaching us legion infantry tactics and how the Roman roads and camps were built. That was Roman political theory, not discourses on the meaning of justice or comparative essays on state organization, but rather how best to build a wall and how to maintain lines of communication in the thick of battle. The Romans did not spend a lot of time with their head in the clouds, but they did spend a lot of time with their feet in the mud. The power, dominance, and stability and legacy of Rome is all wrapped up in its army. Understanding the legions is critical to understanding the Romans, and shifts in how the legions operated mirrored shifts in the socio-political world that surrounded them. I originally intended this section to be one episode, but as I progressed it kept growing and growing, and so, rather than inundating you with too much information, I have decided to divide it into two parts. Today I will give a brief overview of how the legions changed over the years, and then go into detail about the Greek phalanx in particular, what it was, why it was so strong, and what its flaws were. The Romans used the phalanx until the Samnite Wars, 
When they morphed into a new system, I will detail next week. For those of you with a background in ancient history, I'm sure you've heard more than enough about the phalanx, but I want to make sure everyone is on the same page, and I think understanding infantry tactics is critical to understanding classical Mediterranean history as a whole. In general, and this is very general, the army of the Roman Republic had four distinct phases. The first phase was ushered in by Romulus when he founded the army. It was originally formed like any other barbarian horde, with a strong leader leading a mass of men who charged at the enemy and battled hand-to-hand, -hand, one on one, until one side overpowered the other. The second phase began roughly with the class reforms of Servius in the mid-500s BC. At this point, the Romans began to utilize the Greek phalanx, relying on disciplined, group-oriented attacks rather than the free-for-all of Romulus's day. This lasted until the mid-300s BC, when the Samnite Wars exposed dangerous flaws in the phalanx and forced the Romans to reorganize their entire army and start a third phase based around the Manipul, which I will discuss at length next week. Later, around 100 BC, Marius ushered in the fourth and final phase of the Republican army, instituting a series of reforms affecting not just how the army fought tactically, but also how the soldiers were recruited, removing property qualifications and creating the first full-time professional legion. This was a major contributing factor to the death of the Republic and the rise of the Imperium. At this point in the podcast, we have reached one of those watershed moments, the mid-300s BC, that saw a transition from one of these phases to another. And this transition is particularly of vital importance because it moved Rome from having just another classical Greek hoplite army to having an army that was distinctly Roman. The Romans, as I've mentioned, were heavily influenced by the Greeks, not just in art and culture, but also in the employment of arms. In the mid-7th and 8th centuries BC, the Greeks adopted a formation of attack called the phalanx, which was composed of individual soldiers called hoplites. The phalanx was the most formidable method of attack in its day and spread throughout the Mediterranean, finding its way to Rome, as I said, around the mid-500s BC. Put simply, the Greeks abandoned the chaotic charges of man-to-man -man fighting in favor of a highly organized formation, which would charge and engage the enemy as one. For hundreds of years, the only thing that could stop a phalanx was another phalanx of equal strength hence the speed of its adoption throughout the Western world. A phalanx was composed of a single line, 8 to 16 men deep, depending on the battlefield and number of hoplites available. As a rule of thumb, deeper was better for phalanxes, and there were accounts of phalanxes up to 50 men deep in some battles. Commanders had to make hard choices, however, because the line had to be long enough to prevent any outflanking maneuver, which meant certain death, so a balance was always sought between length and depth. At Marathon, for example, the Greeks gambled by spreading their phalanx thin to prevent the numerically superior Persians from outflanking them. The gamble paid off, but the Persians nearly did break the thin Greek line, and had they done so, the history of the world would have been altered dramatically. During battle, the men in the front line held their oval shields, called hoplons, hence the name hoplite, in their left hands and long spears in their right. The hoplites stood close together and in such a way that their shield protected the man to their left and the man on their right protected them. This formed a shield wall that was virtually impenetrable. In between the shields, the spears of the second, third, and sometimes fourth ranks shot through the gaps, stabbing and gorging anything they could. A mass of individual fighters would simply be massacred if they attempted a head-on attack they would be unable to break through a well-disciplined phalanx. Now I know what you're thinking. If a phalanx was 8 or 12 or 16 men deep, and only the front four lines were attacking, what were the other four, eight, or 12 lines doing? The answer is threefold, but all three folds relate to the all-important task of maintaining the cohesion of the phalanx. The first fold is that as the phalanx initially charged each other, and in the subsequent shoving match, the front lines had to be braced by the men behind them, so they literally, physically, could not be pushed back. The second fold is that the most common way a phalanx was broken was by retreat from the rear. Once men started running out the back, there was no more bracing, no more support, and the other army could push right through you. 
A deep line meant removing those back ranks from danger, and hence removing their desire to run away. The man in the back line of a 16-man phalanx was in no danger of being run through with a spear, so he wasn't going to run. It's basic psychology. The third fold is that the stable back ranks prevented the men in front, who really were in physical danger, from running away even if they were scared out of their minds. If anyone in the front ran, then the whole phalanx would break down and everyone would be slaughtered. Now I know what you're thinking again, and the answer is yes. The first few ranks of a phalanx was a really, really crappy place to be. Trapped between an enemy who was trying to kill you, and friends who forced you to stay put, even as they sat, essentially, on the sidelines. The only way to live if you were in the front was to stick together and move forward, so there was a motivational element to the formation as well. There was, indeed, a lot of psychology built into the phalanx. Maybe all that philosophizing on the human condition paid off. In a warrior society like Greece, though, men clamored to be in the front ranks because that's where all the honor and glory was, and where the commanders placed their best men. So, despite all the dangers, they didn't think the front was such a bad place to be. To each his own, I guess. Now, a last important word on the phalanx. It was designed for and used on flat, open plains, where the ranks could be deployed properly, and there were no holes in the line. In a phalanx, a single gap meant death. The survival of the army was absolutely dependent on an unbroken shield wall. In Greece, this worked well because both sides used phalanxes, and so both sought the same sort of terrain. But against an army who used vastly different tactics on unstable, hilly terrain, the phalanx was vulnerable, a fact the Romans would learn the hard way. In the hundreds of years that the Romans had used the standard phalanx, they had been well served because they were fighting either other phalanxes or Gallic hordes who were no match for a solid shield wall with hundreds of spears jutting out of it. But when they met the Samnites, the weaknesses of the phalanx became all too apparent. The steep, rough country of Samnium, where most of the fighting of the Samnite wars took place, made it difficult to deploy and maintain a cohesive phalanx. Plus, the Samnite light infantry and cavalry, used to the terrain, were able to easily outflank the Romans. And as I said, an outflanked phalanx was as good as dead. This fatal flaw spelled the end of the Roman use of the phalanx. It was simply not maneuverable enough. When attacking head-on, a phalanx was indestructible, but once hit from the side or back, it was a sitting duck. The densely packed soldier simply could not turn and set up the critical defensive shield wall in time, encumbered as they were with heavy armor and long spears. If given enough time, the left or right-hand column could reform into a front line, but in battle time was measured in seconds, and a cavalry detachment that managed to get around the line was charging through the ranks in a heartbeat, slaughtering the closely packed hoplites who could not even turn around to defend themselves. This was why the phalanx had to avoid being outflanked at all costs, and why, when the Samnites proved they could get around the Romans, the Romans changed forever their organizational deployment to develop an immunity to this chronic disease. What the Romans developed was the system that has been handed down as the classic Republican army formation, which we will talk about in detail next week. The maniple system and its three-line deployment, famously referred to as a phalanx with joints. of Rome. Last time, we focused on the Greek phalanx, the formation of battle used by the Roman army until the time of the Samnite Wars. This week I want to talk about the new system the Romans developed during and after their war with the Samnites. The new organizational structure would remain the standard for the next 250 odd years until the Marian reform of 107 BC and become known to history as the Maniple System. It was called the Maniple System because it was based around a tactile unit of 120 men called the Maniple, which roughly translates as a handful. This unit was capable of acting independently of the rest of the army or in concert with the whole, giving Roman commanders an advantage over their predecessors 
who had to deal with the bulky single line of a phalanx designed only for closely coordinated forward movement. In a pinch, a general could now order off a single maniple to secure a ridge or plug a hole or turn to face an enemy from behind without jeopardizing the cohesion of the rest of the army. And the new Roman general had another advantage over his predecessor. The Romans abandoned the single line in favor of a staggered three-line deployment. At the outset of battle, the lines formed with ten maniples in the front, ten in the middle, and ten half maniples in the back, arrayed in a checkerboard fashion. Some sources say there were 15 maniples in the front line, and some say there were 15 in the front too. The specifics are hard to weed out due to the lack of source material and the competing claims held therein. So I'm saying 10, 10, and 10, because that seems to be the general consensus, but just know that I could be wrong, and without a time machine we'll never know for sure. Somewhere between 10 and 15 in the front two lines anyway, and definitely 10 in the back. The front-line maniples were made up of the youngest and most inexperienced soldiers, generally aged 16 to 20, out on their first campaigns. The second line was made up of soldiers in the prime of their lives, between the ages of 20 and 40. The back line was made up of the oldest troops, veterans of countless campaigns with all the wisdom and skill that follows from age and experience. Organizationally, each single maniple had four officers, two front, senior centurions, and two back junior centurions. They were called centurions because they commanded a single century, the most basic organizational unit of the army, and a maniple was composed of two centuries, hence two officers. A Roman army century was not composed of a hundred men, as is commonly and mistakenly believed, but rather sixty to eighty men. The senior of the two senior centurions was the commander of the maniple and placed in the front right when in battle. They were expected to lead by example and be the first ones in and the last ones out of any fight. The mortality rate among centurions was thus the highest in the army, but again, as with the front ranks of the phalanx, men clamored for the position because of the honor it brought them and their families. The basic theory was to attack first with the front line only, who, being young, were strong and full of stamina. Ideally, the rest of the army would never have to attack, and the front line would take care of the enemy. But this rarely happened. Inevitably, the second line would be ordered in to support the first. These troops, hardened, strong, and experienced, were usually enough to secure victory. The enemy, worn down from fighting the Roman youth, would be no match for those youth plus an equal number of veterans. If this was not enough, however, the last line was ordered in to support. If this back line got involved, it meant that things were not going well for the Romans, but the old men were usually enough to break the back of a particularly stubborn enemy. The maniple system was based around the principle of time-release freshness. Opponents of Rome would attack all at once and with great fervor, often overexerting themselves by the belief that they could overwhelm the front Roman line easily and move on to the rest of the army. But things were rarely that easy for them, and, bogged down by the front line of Roman youth, the opposing armies became fatigued and were then routed when the rest of the Roman army got involved. Beyond these three basic lines of heavy infantry, there were three other important elements needed to complete the legion as it lined up for battle. First, there was the light infantry, made up of men rich enough to qualify for service, but too poor to afford all the gear needed to survive in heavy infantry fighting. In any given legion, there were between 1,000 and 1,200 of these fighters, who, at the beginning of battle, stood in front of the three lines to mask the size and formation of the Roman army. When the signal for battle was given, the light infantry would rush the enemy and hurl spears and javelins, attempting to disrupt the cohesion and inflict some minor damage, before retreating quickly through the three lines to the back of the legion. Light infantry never made much of a difference in the actual fighting, having served their purpose if the enemy remained in the dark about Roman formations, and eventually, when the state began to take responsibility for the arming of soldiers, the light troops were phased out and folded into the rest of the lines. On the wings, as was typical of the day, the Romans placed the cavalry. Their job was to engage the opposing cavalry and take them out of the fight, so the two infantry lines had to fight head-to-head -head without help, a fight the Romans always felt they could win. Once the opposing cavalry was out of the way, 
the Roman horsemen would plunge into the enemy lines and attempt to do as much damage as they possibly could. In addition to these two basic tasks, the cavalry was always watchful of potential flanking maneuvers or surprise attacks from the rear. Constitutionally, the cavalry was initially made up of the richest Romans, the Equites, but as the years passed, the Romans farmed out cavalry work to their allies, never being great horsemen themselves. And these allies were the third element needed to complete a standard legion. Also stationed on the wings, between the Roman lines and the cavalry, the allies were somewhere in between heavy and light infantry. Through the Republican period, they were led by Roman officers, but as time went on, they began to be led by their own chiefs or generals. The allies were required to contribute an equal number of infantry and twice the cavalry that the Romans themselves provided. These draft requirements would cause constant tension between Rome and her subjects and was the main precipitous for the Latin War, the Latins becoming fed up with sharing equally in the burdens but getting shafted in the spoils. In total, the Roman fighting strength was optimally between eight and 10,000 men, with 4,200 Roman legionnaires, an equal number of allies, and just shy of 1,000 cavalry. The numbers varied based on time, place, and mitigating factors, and these numbers are round, but they will give you some ideas to the size of the legion as it marched into battle. When it marched from place to place, however, it was attended by a baggage train of non-combatants numbering themselves in the thousands. So it would not be surprising to see a legion of 4,200 men marching through the countryside 15,000 strong. When actually engaging the enemy, the Roman tactics were straightforward. Each soldier was equipped with two spears and a sword. As they approached the enemy, they hurled the spears and inflicted as much damage as they could before meeting them hand to hand. And this tactic differs little in theory from today's artillery, which is supposed to soften up the enemy for an infantry attack. The Romans experimented with the composition and design of their spears, settling generally on an instrument that had a thin metal connector between the blade and shaft, so when the spear struck its target, the thin metal connector would bend under the weight of the heavy shaft behind it. And this served two purposes. It weighed down soldiers and shields that were struck, but it also made the Roman spears unusable to the enemy, for it was common practice in the ancient world to throw back spears hurled in by the enemy. When the gap between the armies was closed, the legionnaires pulled out their short swords, double-edged and sharp at the tip. This could be used either for stabbing or slashing, and were incredibly destructive in close quarters. The famous Gladius has not appeared yet in our narrative, which emerged after the Romans encountered Spanish swordcraft in the next century, but the principles behind that famous sword were already present. Once engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was simply a matter of killing or wounding everything that moved until the enemy broke and fled. In addition to these forward, offensive-minded tactics, the new maniple system also had a built-in defensive strategy. If the front lines were overwhelmed, they could quickly retreat between the gaps in the middle line and regroup behind the more capable middle-aged fighters, and if they faltered, then they could all hide behind the third line, and by this time the first line would be ready to fight again, which allowed the Romans to retreat without having it devolve into a frightened, unorganized free-for-all. The phalanx lacked this element, and once it broke, it was every man for himself. The maniple system also had the advantage of being far harder to flank than a phalanx. Any attempt to do so would either be met by the cavalry, backline maniples ordered forward, or by frontline maniples themselves peeled off from the main fight and sent in a different direction. All in all, it was a significant advancement from the phalanx, and as we will later see, when the Romans clashed with the Macedonians around 200 BC, the result would be a clear and decisive victory of maniple over phalanx. But it was not just the system that made the legion so dominant. It's not that anyone could be inserted and the result would have been the same. Nor was it the case that the Romans were bigger or stronger than their opponents. In fact, in many cases, facing huge lumbering Germanic tribes, the Romans looked puny by comparison. Rather, the legions prevailed because of group discipline that became the nightmare of opposing armies. In general, ancient warfare was a passionate affair with lots of yelling, chest beating, and frenzy. But the Roman legion was a cold, inhuman machine. They were never intimidated and rarely broke ranks.
Their comrades could be dying to their right and left, but the legionnaire himself seemed unaffected and kept moving forward. This was unsettling to say the least, and sapped the morale of Rome's enemies. The Roman soldier did this not because he was unfeeling, quite the contrary, the Romans were a passionate people, but in war there was only one thing a legionnaire feared more than the enemy, his commanding officer. Roman discipline was notoriously harsh, though it was not without its positive aspects. It was based on a system of rewards and punishment that were designed to promote bravery and eliminate cowardness. Punishment ranged anywhere from psychological humiliation, for example, a disgraced sentry might be forced to eat standing up so their comrades would always know who had lost their standard, to scourging for, say, disobeying orders, and up to death, a punishment that was handed down routinely when the actions of an individual put the entire army at risk, like, for example, falling asleep while on sentry duty. Woe to the sentry who fell asleep. He was stoned and beaten to death by his comrades. Not a pretty sight, but keeping watch was a sacred trust that could not be breached under any circumstances. It was simply too important. On the flip side, the Romans invented a plethora of fancy medals and awards given out to soldiers who distinguished themselves in battle. I have already talked about the grass crown given to a soldier who saves an entire legion, but there were literally hundreds of other honors. For example, an award was given to the first man over a wall when the army was assaulting an enemy camp or city. And this was not taken lightly. For whole centuries, lines and legions took it as a matter of great pride when one of their own took the prize. So when competing claims were brought to the attention of a commander, great care had to be taken in adjudicating the decision because tempers were always running hot when awards were on the line. The most common rewards ranged from double rations, a huge motivator, to promises of more land when released from service, to heads of cattle. Anything a soldier valued would be metered out for instances of selfless bravery which the Roman commanders were always promoting. There was a darkly humorous case during the Second Punic War of a commander promising extra rations for every enemy head brought back to camp. But the soldiers became so burdened by the work of beheading and carrying heads that they began to actually lose the fight. And in the heat of battle, the commander had to issue a proclamation that everyone would receive extra rations regardless of the heads, but they did have to actually win the fight, which the soldiers, now free of their grisly baggage, promptly did. This discipline allowed the Romans to keep their cool in battle and keep plugging away rather than running. They knew what would happen if their corpse was found on the field with a wound in the back. They would be buried without honor and their family would be ostracized. Those who fled from Cannae, one of the greatest defeats in Roman history, were never allowed to return home, remaining in exile, fighting in Sicily until finally they were allowed to serve as bait for Hannibal and die with dignity in a suicide mission something they had pleaded for for years and were finally granted. The last thing I want to impress upon you about the superiority of the Roman legion over enemy forces was their meticulous attention to detail. It is often said that amateurs study tactics, but professionals study logistics, and the Romans embodied this belief. They took great care to always preserve supply lines, communication lines, and set up their camps in the most defensible possible position. This last was critical because the Greeks, for example, set up their camps to simply be close to the site of battle without thought to any other practical considerations. The Romans, however, took great care in ensuring they held the high ground and were in a well-defensible spot. A routed Roman army often staved off final defeat behind the walls of their camps, and many Roman victories were secured by overrunning the poorly constructed camps of their enemies. The Romans always scouted and protected sources of food and fresh water, and, knowing that this often meant the difference between a strong army in the field and a weak one, always sought to cut off the food and water supplies of their enemies before engaging in battle. Battles were often won or lost based on nothing more than the existence of a good breakfast on the day of the battle. So as much time as they spent trying to figure out how to neutralize opposing cavalry, they spent ten times as much time thinking about how to secure pasture land for their horses. It was the boring details of making sure everyone had proper footwear and that the trenches were dug to a proper depth that really set the Romans apart from their enemies, who often had every intention of just showing up for a fight. 
The Romans never just showed up for a fight. They planned everything down to the smallest detail. The fight itself became almost an afterthought. So there you have it. That, in a nutshell, is the Roman Legion of the Republic. Three lines made up of units of 120 men with cavalry and allies protecting the wings. More versatile than the phalanx, the maniple system would remain largely unchanged for the next 250 years, and it would be this incarnation of the legion that did most of the heavy lifting of the territorial expansion throughout the Mediterranean. When we get to Marius, I will discuss at length the changes he introduced and how they changed the face of Rome forever. But that is for another time. Next week we will get back into the action as Rome prepares for her longest and most grueling challenge to date, the second or great Samnite War. Welcome to the history of Rome. The Romans enjoyed ten years of peace after the end of the Latin War in 338 BC and spent the years quietly expanding their territory. This decade saw the emergence of a new attitude towards territorial expansion. It was no longer enough to merely ensure the survival of Rome by controlling Latium and fending off intruders. The Romans now sought to spread their influence over a much wider geographic area in order to draw taxes and manpower from a wider pool of citizens. No one power had controlled the entire Italian peninsula before, but the Romans started to think that maybe they could pull it off. They essentially looked around Italy, sized up the competition, liked their odds, and went for it. The Samnites were A number one on the list of potential threats, and the Romans knew that if they were able to conquer the powerful hill tribe, nothing would stand in their way of conquering all of Italy. However, the Romans were loath to simply expand. That would be immoral. The Romans only engaged in just wars when they or one of their allies was threatened. They would never declare a war unprovoked. It was considered barbaric. So they set about needling the Samnites into attacking first so Rome could enter the war it wanted honorably. They dispatched citizens to form a colony in Samnite territory, figuring the Samnites would either let them get away with it, and the Romans would have gained more land without drawing swords, or the Samnites would attack, and the Romans would come to the rescue of their besieged citizens. Things did not go exactly by Roman design, but in the end they did get their war. The Samnites were caught up at the time fighting the Greeks in the south, and could not immediately respond to the Roman settlement, so the Romans, emboldened, set up another. When the Samnites concluded their war with the Greeks, they did turn west, but it was not to directly engage the Roman colonies. Rather, they moved on the Greek city of Neapolis, which is present-day Naples, forging an agreement with its citizens to aid their dream of expanding off the coast and into greater Campania. The nobility of Neapolis, however, dismayed at the Samnite garrison and the loss of control over their own city, turned to Rome for assistance. It was the call Rome was looking for, but it was something of a letdown. Fighting the Samnites in Campania would not garner them any more land if they won, which was the whole point of provoking the Samnites. But, reluctant to pass up the opportunity, they agreed to help the Neapolitan nobility and drive off the Samnite garrison, which they did, sparking the Second Samnite War in 327 BC. The early momentum was clearly in Roman hands. Samnite allies were peeled off, and the Romans won victory after victory on the battlefield. In fact, the only major defeat for the Romans in these early years came as a result not of Samnite strength, but of a psychological mutiny by the Roman army against their own commander, the result of an extended melodrama which is too juicy for me to not relate in detail. In 325 BC, as would be the case in many of these years, a dictator, Lucius Papirius Cursor, was appointed to oversee the war effort and Quintus Fabius Maximus, the grandfather of the more famous Fabius Maximus, who saw Rome through the early disastrous years of the Second Punic War, was named his master of horse. They set out for Samnium, but the taking of the auspices, a critical superstitious step for all Roman endeavors, had been done poorly, or was messed up, or showed ill omens. 
Whatever was wrong, Papirius decided to head back to Rome and retake them in an attempt to secure a favorable sign from the gods. He very clearly ordered Fabius not to engage the Samnites while he was gone, but Fabius, being young, could not help himself. The Samnites, knowing the Roman commander was away, were relaxed, believing no battle imminent. Fabius, on his own initiative, decided that it would be a perfect time for a sneak attack. He ordered the army out, routing the surprised Samnites easily, and captured their camp along with a great deal of plunder. When Papirius returned, however, he was enraged, red in the face, screaming and cursing enraged. How could Fabius have so clearly disobeyed him when the whole purpose for leaving was to align Roman interests with the gods' favor? By attacking before securing favorable auspices, Fabius endangered not just the army, but Rome as a whole. Then, singing the praises of Manlius, who, you will recall, executed his own son for disobedience, Papirius ordered Fabius arrested. The army was incredulous. They had just won an easy victory thanks to Fabius's decisive action, and now Papirius wanted to punish him? It was absurd. The general feeling was that Papirius was simply jealous for missing out on the glory. Despite entreaties from the officers, however, Papirius insisted on Fabius's arrest. A slow-moving riot began to build, which was cut off only by nightfall. And during the night, Fabius, understanding that Papirius had every intention of executing him the next morning, escaped from the camp and made for Rome with all haste. Upon reaching the city, Fabius and his father, who had previously been consul and was a man of high standing, went before the Senate to plead the young man's case. Papirius showed up, and the scene from the camp was repeated. Papirius was a towering inferno of rage. He railed against Fabius's disobedience and sacrilege, and pointed to the irreparable harm the boy had done to army discipline and the moral fiber of the state itself. There was nothing untrue about what Papirius said, but the Senate pleaded with him to go easy on Fabius. He was a popular young noble, and, after all, had just won a great victory. Wasn't Papirius taking this all just a bit too far? By this point, Papirius was getting shrill, and I can't help but picture the senators looking sideways at each other as he launched into another red-faced harangue and thinking, geez, man, lighten up. In the end, when it became clear that absolutely no one supported him, Papirius attempted to salvage some dignity, not just for himself, but for the office of dictator, which was in danger of becoming irrelevant. He agreed to lift the sentence of death and content himself with stripping Fabius of his power and leaving him behind in Rome. Returning to the army, Papirius ordered his troops to pursue and engage the reformed Samnite army, but this time, instead of an easy victory, the Samnites managed to get the upper hand. The Roman soldiers, who loved Fabius and hated Papirius, had no intention of letting the dictator win any battles, so they, in effect, through the fight. Papirius, though, did not ride off into the history books as a shrill and overbearing failure, and to his credit he saw the error of his ways. He had come down too harshly on Fabius, and in doing so had lost the support of his troops. So he spent the next few days endearing himself to them, visiting the wounded and treading lightly with his discipline. He won back the favor of the men, and when he ordered them out to fight the next time, they did not disappoint and delivered to him the victory that he sought. Over the course of the war, Papirius would serve as consul four times, and when he finally did write off into the history books, he was remembered as a great commander and one of the best men of his generation. After Papirius's victory, the Samnites sued for peace, but the Roman Senate demanded such lopsided terms that the Samnites could not accept, and the war continued. It would prove to be a mistake of the highest order, because the Romans were about to walk into one of their greatest and arguably most humiliating defeats in their history. At least at Cannae, the Roman army was beaten in the field, but Caudine Forks ended with the Romans so completely outmaneuvered that their army never drew their swords before offering them to the Samnites in surrender. Many saw it as punishment for the hubris Rome had shown towards the Samnite peace envoys. The defeat at Caudine Forks, however, just as the defeat of Cannae would a century later, did nothing less than prove that the Romans were cut from a completely different cloth than their contemporaries. Any other state, when faced with such catastrophic defeats, would have quit and prayed for mercy from their enemies. 
But the Romans never even gave it a thought. They never quit. They just kept coming. At Caudine Forks, the Romans were set up perfectly by the Samnite commander, Gaius Pontius. He dispatched some of his soldiers into Roman territory, masquerading as non-combatant herdsmen. When they inevitably fell into the hands of Roman patrols, they all told the same story to their captors. The full force of the Samnite army was besieging the city of Lucaria, a Roman ally. The Romans, hearing this information repeated from multiple sources, bought the story hook, line, and sinker. They sent both consuls with their armies to aid Lucaria, but, of course, the Samnites were nowhere near Lucaria. They were stationed near Caudium, specifically at the pass where the Romans would have to travel to get to Lucaria. Called the Caudine Forks, the pass started very narrow, then opened into a wide plain, and then became very narrow again on the way out. On either side, steep peaks prevented any movement besides forward and backward. The consuls led their army hastily into the pass, believing all the danger to lie ahead. But when they reached the other side of the flat plain, they found their exit blocked off by a pile of boulders. Sensing that something was amiss, the consuls immediately ordered a retreat, but by this time it was too late. The Samnites had already blockaded the other end as well. The Roman army was trapped and in a hopeless position. Soldiers joked darkly about their pointless labor as the consuls ordered them to build a fortified camp. There was no getting out, and there would be no attack to repel. The Samnites would simply wait the requisite three days for them to run out of food and demand surrender. The consuls and their officers recognized the immensity of their blunder as they tossed around impossible to execute escape plans. The next morning Pontius sent for his father, who, though retired, was a great military strategist and asked for the old man's advice about what to do with the trapped Romans. At first his father sent word that Pontius should let the army walk away unharmed. Unsure of the message, for it seemed a crazy notion, Pontius sent for clarification, and when word came again, the message had changed. It now read, kill them all, down to the last man. This sounded more like his father, but Pontius was confused and unsure whether the old man had slipped into senility. Hadn't he just said to let them all go? So he sent for his father and asked him to join him at Caudium. When the old man arrived, he told his son that he still retained his senses, and neither message had been a mistake. The best option, by far, he said, was to spare the army and return them unharmed to Rome, for in doing so they would win the internal friendship and gratitude of the Roman people, and hostilities would end forever. The second best option was to kill them all, and end hostilities for at least a generation, by decimating Rome's available manpower and filling the Roman populace with terror of the Samnites. There are no other options, the old man said, extreme generosity or extreme cruelty. That was it. But Pontius was unnerved by both and settled on a third option that his father warned him, correctly, would win him no friends and eliminate no enemies. He would let the army go, but force them to surrender under the yoke, a humiliating ritual in which the defeated army must pass beneath a horizontal spear lashed to two vertical spears, creating a gate of sorts that the soldiers had to stoop to pass beneath. To the honor-crazed armies of the ancient world, this humiliation was far worse than being killed on the battlefield. Far, far worse. And to the men who surrendered at Caudine, their humiliation would be doubled because they had never even drawn their swords. They were never given the opportunity to die gloriously in battle and take as many Samnites as they could with them. It was absolutely unheard of to give up without a fight, and the thought of it mortally offended every soldier in the army, but their orders were clear and pass under the yoke they did. The army that marched back to Rome was unlike any that had gone before it or would come after. They marched weaponless and in complete silence, walking and eating without saying a word or even looking up from the ground. Some said that the Samnites had defeated the spirit of Rome itself, but savvy observers warned that this was unlikely, that the silent army was not devoid of spirit, but merely smoldering with such an intense rage that words could not express their emotions and woe to those upon whom Rome's fury would be unleashed. The terms of the peace also called for 600 cavalrymen, i.e. the sons of the richest men in Rome, to be held as hostages, as well as for the consuls and their officers to become guarantors of the peace, 
an official, half-religious, half-legal position in ancient international diplomacy. In effect, it meant that upon their return to Rome, they must force the Senate and people to accept the terms of peace offered at the battlefield. If they did not, the gods would punish Rome as a whole if the guarantors who were in breach of their duty did not hand themselves back over to the Samnites, who would sell them as slaves. This threat was supposed to be enough to compel even unhappy guarantors to do their duty, and it usually was, but, like I say, the Romans were cut from a completely different cloth. It is unclear at what point Posthumius, one of the consuls, decided to breach the trust, whether it was his plan all along, or whether he decided to do so after reaching Rome. But when he stood before the Senate and delivered the official account of events leading up to the surrender and the terms of the peace, he urged them not to accept, but reject the Samnites' offer and immediately re-raise the army and attack. He and his colleagues had been foolish, but that did not mean Rome itself should admit defeat. Further, he said, he and his officers would immediately march back to where Pontius waited for word and surrender themselves, releasing Rome from its obligation to honor the terms of the treaty. The Senate, who had been ready to castigate Posthumius and his colleague in the harshest terms, now praised them to the heavens. The two consuls and their officers, a priest in tow to witness the whole thing, returned to the Samnite army and surrendered themselves, announcing that Rome rejected peace and did so with the full favor of the gods. Pontius was incensed and refused to accept the surrender, claiming that the sneaky Romans were just trying to weasel their way out of defeat with a legalistic reading of the pact. No one who swore to be a guarantor abandoned his duty and thought that just by surrendering himself he had absolved his nation of guilt. It was outrageous, but there Posthumius stood doing exactly that. If Rome wanted to play chicken with the gods, that was fine with Pontius, and ordered his men to let Posthumius and his officers walk away unmolested, so the offer of surrender would never be accepted, and the pact, at least from the Samnite perspective, would remain in breach. How much of this story is propaganda and how much is true is up in the air. There is no doubt, though, that following the defeat at the Caudine Forks, there was a five-year lull in hostilities. It seems reasonable that the five years of peace was somehow related to the terms of the surrender, but according to the Romans, they never recognized any peace and were free and clear to continue fighting if they wished. I suspect that the story of Posthumius' surrender is overblown. It mirrors closely a story from the First Punic War, in which a captured general is returned to Rome to secure a peace treaty, but instead tells the Senate to keep fighting and then honorably returns to Carthage, where the promise of torture and death await him. But even if the Romans had believed they could keep fighting, unbound by any treaty, that did not mean that they would necessarily have wanted to. Caudine Forks had been a humiliation, that much is certain, and the Romans would have had no interest in allowing history to repeat itself. Perhaps the five-year layoff was simply Rome being cautious. Clearly the Samnites were more clever than they had been given credit for. There was no sense in giving them the opportunity to crush Rome's dreams of empire, so soon after they had been fully, consciously articulated. The Romans would bide their time. Patience was another great Roman virtue. They were in no hurry. They just wanted to be sure of victory. Most likely, though, a five-year peace was forced on the Romans, who had no choice but to submit to the Samnite terms. And no such episode of bold defiance ever occurred. Next week, we will pick up when hostilities begin again, around 315 B.C., at that point, the Etruscans in the north and the Greeks in the south would both become involved as well, leading the fight between the Romans and Samnites to become a struggle that embroiled all the major powers in Italy. Hello, and welcome to the history of Rome. The Romans licked their wounds, or perhaps more accurately, nursed their egos, after the defeat at Caudine Forks in 321 BC. Five years passed with the Romans engaging their neighbors in minor skirmishes, but avoiding another major confrontation with the Samnites. 
Whether this was because of an official peace treaty or out of Roman fear is still unclear, but whatever the cause, there was a break in the fighting. All that changed in 316 BC, however, when the Romans, confident once again, marched out and attempted again to conquer the Samnites. This second stage of the war started out no better for the Romans than the first had ended, though. But they soon gained the upper hand, and after ten years of hard fighting, the Romans would force the Samnites to submit in 304 BC. In the race to victory, the Romans stumbled out of the gates. In 315 BC, they met the Samnites near Laudale and were defeated in convincing fashion. Details of the battle are sketchy, but it appears certain that the dictator commanding the Roman legion was killed in the fighting. Rome's power was now on the verge of completely unraveling. They had lost a major battle at Caudine without a fight, and now, on their big comeback tour, when they actually took the field against the Samnites, they were soundly beaten. Things were not looking good for the Romans. Campania, the territory over which Rome and Samnium had originally clashed, was perilously close to abandoning their treaty with Rome, so recently entered into, and giving themselves over to the Samnites. Tarentum, a major Greek city in the south, had already declared for the Samnites, and now negotiations had begun to bring the Etruscans into the fray. However, the Etruscans bought high on Samnite power, and, when they did enter the war, found themselves overmatched by a newly resurgent Rome. It was during these years that the Romans began to radically alter the legion's organization and tactics, switching from the clunky phalanx into the maneuverable three-line maniple system. Once the structural deficiencies of their army were ironed out, Rome's advantage in wealth and manpower left little doubt as to the final outcome of the war. One of the ways that wealth manifested itself as an aid to the war effort was in an infrastructure project that survives today, a living monument to Roman engineering genius, the Via Appia, or Appian Way. During the first Samnite War, though they emerged victorious, the Romans struggled constantly to move troops and supplies south into Campania and Samnium in anything resembling quick time. Wet marshy land separated the two points, literally bogging down efforts. Roads through the foothills above were too hazardous, and the only other route was a long, arduous trip along the coast. The Romans needed a way to get into Campania quickly, and began to entertain the idea of building a straight road linking Rome and Capua, the capital city of Campania. The proposals never got off the ground, as resources were tied up first with the Latin War, then again with the Samnites, but in 312 BC, a man came forward with the vision and will to accomplish the goal. Appius Claudius, whose name was attached to the road for his efforts, was a member in good standing of one of the more controversial families in Rome, the Claudi. Implacable foes of the Popeleans, the Claudi never lacked for enemies. Indeed, it had been another Appius Claudius who had headed the Decemvri in its efforts to consolidate power after compiling the Twelve Tables of Law around 450 BC. But the Appius Claudius of whom we speak today outdid them all in pomposity and pretensions to infallibility. He remains himself one of the more interesting and infamous figures in Roman history, both the driving force behind some of the most ambitious public works projects in history, and a man who seemed coolly untroubled by his own thrashing of constitutional and religious precedents. Claudius was elected censor, an office of enormous importance, in 312 BC, along with a colleague. One of the critical functions of the censors at this point was to declare who was eligible for the Senate and who was eligible to vote. Claudius, rather than simply following the previous year's roles, as was the custom, decided to drastically alter the composition of the Senate and the electorate, expelling members he considered his enemies and enrolling men who promised him loyalty. Aghast, his colleague resigned, knowing that if he did so, Claudius would be stopped, because any time one censor died or resigned, the other stepped down so two fresh censors could stand in their place. But Claudius refused to step down, sparking a minor constitutional crisis. The manipulated Senate, however, made of senators who owed their office to Claudius, predictably remained silent. Despite calls for his head, Claudius remained in office. He then further infuriated public opinion by taking certain sacred rights away from a family he disapproved of and passing them into the hands of public slaves. For this offense, Claudius was allegedly struck blind by the gods, though accounts of his eyesight loss do not crop up until later in the annals, 
and then seemed to only describe his final days as old blind Claudius declaring Rome's determined opposition to Pyrrhus's invasion. In any event, blind or not, Claudius set to work on his pet projects, two of which stood foremost in his mind. The road to Capua, which would bear his name, and a series of aqueducts that would guarantee a fresh water supply for Rome, which would also bear his name. The Romans had finally accepted Claudius as single censor and even applauded his lead in the public works, but he set off a fresh firestorm when his term of office expired after 18 months. He shocked everyone by declaring that he would not be stepping down. Rome was aghast at this sacrilege. He had sworn an oath to step down and now flouted it with all the hubris of a Greek tragic hero. In the end, Claudius would remain censor for five unprecedented years, generally upsetting constitutional purists, but endearing himself to the people with his liberal dispensations from the treasury, the obvious benefits of his projects, and his policies of enfranchisement, for he extended the vote to landless citizens who otherwise had no voice at all. He proved sufficiently popular that when he stepped down, he immediately won election as consul. In later years, the scandals of Appius Claudius were largely forgotten, and he was remembered first and foremost as the man who gave the Romans their most important road and their most important network of aqueducts. The Appian Way, after it had served its immediate military purpose, would evolve into the main artery of travel and trade for the Romans, eventually stretching over 500 miles southeast across the peninsula. Equipped with their new road, made of stone, bowed to prevent water collection, and supported by retaining walls, the Romans were now able to keep their troops in Samnium far better supplied than before, and the war began to slowly turn against the Samnites. The Roman strategy was straightforward, though it took years to see it through to the end. The Samnites, unlike their neighbors in the lowlands, did not concentrate in large cities, and as a result, there was no one place the Romans could target to bring a swift conclusion to hostilities. They had to proceed piecemeal, cutting off Samnite communities from each other by holding the mountain passes and building fortresses along navigable rivers. Once an area was secure, the Romans could move on, at all times doing their best to cut off supply routes and access to summer or winter pasture land and so disrupt the entire Samnite way of life. In this way, the Romans slowly hemmed in the Samnites and annexed more and more of their territory, sending in colonists and taking possession of Samnium bit by little bit. The Samnites, however, were not the only enemy the Romans now faced. The Etruscans, mustering what solidarity they could, rose up in arms in 311 BC and opened a whole new theater of operations. Each year the Romans designated one of their consuls to handle operations in Samnium, while the other went north to Etruria. It speaks volumes of the manpower and wealth available to Rome that they were able to run wars on two completely separate fronts and emerge victorious from both. The Romans were in the driver's seat for most of the decade, with the Senate truly gripped by panic only once, in 310 BC, and even then it was a panic from a lack of information rather than from any true danger. In the north, the consul in charge, former insubordinate master of horse Quintus Fabius, went off the radar for a while. He had defeated an Etruscan army, and the survivors had fled into the Cominian Forest, a dense, roadless, wooded area which was off-limits to the superstitious Romans. But Fabius decided reports about rodents of unusual side lurking in the forest were overblown and took his army in, pursuing the fleeing Etruscan army. He was out of contact for some time, which would have been a cause for concern, but not alarm, had not his colleague in Samnium been wounded in battle at the same time. The Senate, back in Rome, received word that one consul was injured, who knew how badly, and the other had led his army into the nightmare woods of the Cominian forest and began to panic. In point of fact, though, the consul in Samnium recovered from his minor injuries quickly, and Quintus Fabius was actually in the process of securing an alliance with the people who dwelled inside the Cominian. But the Senate knew none of this. Papirius Cursor, the man who had ordered the execution of young Fabius, was appointed dictator by the panicky Senate and led an army of fresh recruits into Etruria to track down the lost legions. When he arrived, Fabius had already emerged from the woods, new allies in tow. 
He was surprised and horrified to find that his command had been given to Papirius, whom he understandably bore some resentment over the drama a few years earlier. But he submitted to the Senate's will and allowed Papirius to take command. Together they led their combined army against the regrouped Etruscans near Lake Vadimo. The resulting battle was the only clash with the Etruscans that was ever in doubt. All three Roman lines became involved, and the tide did not turn until late in the day. The Etruscans, however, eventually broke and fled. They never again caused the Romans serious trouble, surrendering in 308 BC, leaving the Samnites to carry on alone. The Samnites were now in desperate straits. They were having difficulty with their supply lines, their armies could not link up with one another, they were constantly outnumbered, and their communities were beginning to suffer terribly under what was, in essence, a massive siege, not of a city, but of an entire territory. The Samnites held on as long as they could, but finally, reluctantly, sued for peace in 304 BC, bringing an end to the Second Samnite War. They had lost a great deal of their territory, and the Romans had founded 13 colonies in and around Samnium. In the north, the Romans had pushed deep into Etruscan territory, and either controlled by arms or alliance, most of what had once been the most powerful confederation in Italy. Roman garrisons settled in across the peninsula, leaving only the Greek-controlled south untouched by Roman power. The Second Samnite War had been an incredibly transformative period of time. Italy had gone from being a land of fractured and competing sovereigns to a land under the control of a single dominant power. Roman citizenship was extended in its various gradient forms to tribes across the peninsula, who recognized more and more that their future prosperity would be determined by their relationship with Rome. And though the Romans were of course resisted, and at this point their domination was by no means complete, as many as fought simply acquiesced and welcomed the Romans with open arms. As I noted previously, the Romans treated those who submitted without a fight with amazing generosity, giving them full access to Roman prosperity. Though they gave up their sovereignty and were required to submit soldiers for the legions, they received their fair share of the spoils and were allowed, as was standard Roman practice, a great deal of latitude in their own local rule. The Romans themselves also changed. Obviously the makeup of the legions was now radically different than it had been, with its strategy, tactics, and organization completely overhauled. But the completion of the Appian Way and the aqueducts, so impressive in their scope and so well conceived in their construction, that it signaled a change in the Romans as a whole, as they began to outpace their contemporaries in terms of their level of civilization. Rome, in short, was becoming the Rome we think of and remember today. The Rome that keeps us fascinated 1500 years after the fall of their empire. The Samnites, however, were not done yet. After 10 years of peace, they realized that any treaty with Rome meant effectively an end to their independence forever. Rome was moving inexorably in the direction of imperial master, not simply powerful neighbor. In a last, desperate play for general Italian independence, the Samnites organized and led a coalition that included the Etruscans, the Umbrians, and even the Gauls against Roman power. Next week, we will cover the resulting conflict, known as the Third Samnite War, though the name is a bit of a misnomer. It was not simply Rome against the Samnites, but Rome against everyone. And in this war against everyone, Rome would win, and everyone else would lose. Hello, and welcome to the history of Rome. As the 300s gave way to the 200s BC, Rome found itself the de facto master of Italy. It was not yet official, but for all intents and purposes, Italy belonged to Rome. Certainly the Romans saw themselves as being in charge, and their actions in the immediate aftermath of the long Second Samnite War demonstrated this. But in the volatile ancient world, a beaten enemy one year was often victorious the next, so though Rome was surrounded by beaten enemies, 
next year was just around the corner. Rome's attitude towards the fiercely independent Samnites and once regal Etruscans led to smoldering resentment across Rome's new territory, which, I suppose, was the source of their resentment, Rome considering Etruria and Samnium to be newly conquered territory, ripe for settlement and colonization, while the natives saw their treaties with Rome as being between equals. Unequal terms, yes, but between equals. When Rome started planning colonies in Samnium and parading the legions through Etruria, a fresh talk of resistance and war began again. The Samnites in particular understood that Rome was now driven by visions of a peninsula-wide empire, and peace meant little more than death by population migration and displacement, rather than by a sword to the head. They were proud of their culture and language and way of life, and saw all too well what the future held for a passive Samnite nation, a mere footnote in Roman history books. At least if they fought, they could be the subjects of one more podcast episode. In 298 BC, the Samnites began to resist Roman incursions into their land. Rome sent envoys to Samnium to demand that the Treaty of Peace be honored, but the Samnites were done with the treaty, and war was declared once again. Two consular armies, two armies under the command of a consul, so four total legions, were sent into Samnium in 297 BC. The Samnites were unprepared for this onslaught, and the army they had raised at its level best to stay away from the Romans, not wanting to risk a full-scale battle that they would surely lose. So the consuls, Marcus Valerius, no longer the intemperate young master of horse, but by now an old man and widely considered to be the most able of all the Roman generals, and Publius Decius, son of the legendary Decius, who won the grass crown and sacrificed himself in battle, spent the year ransacking the countryside. Eventually the Samnite army, still unwilling to fight in the open, left Samnium altogether and made its way to Etruria. They knew they could never defeat the Romans alone. They needed help. The next year, Appius Claudius, he of the Appian Way, was elected consul again. The people wanted to return Marcus Valerius as consul for the second year in a row, but he begged off, citing the mandatory decade wait before holding office again scolding the Romans for attempting to abandon the rule of law just because they were faced with an emergency. Chastened, the electorate re-voted and elected instead a plebeian named Lucius Volumnius. When the Etruscans began to rise up as well, the two new consuls drew lots to determine their spheres of command. Volumnius was assigned Samnium, while Claudius drew Etruria. When Volumnius arrived in Samnium, he found that its army remained in semi-exile. He marched around, capturing towns, raiding for plunder, generally enriching himself and his men with ease. But he knew that there was no threat to Rome to be found amongst the women and children and old men of Samnium. Rome's enemies were in Etruria, he thought. What in the world am I doing here? At this point, a discrepancy in the record emerges. According to Volumnius, Claudius sent him a distressed letter confirming his fears, stating that the Etruscans and Samnite armies had joined forces and Volumnius must come to Etruria at once to help. Volumnius, seeing no danger in leaving Samnium, marched his legions north to Etruria to answer Claudius's call for help. When he arrived, however, Claudius denied having ever written such a letter. Claudius said that he was well in command of the situation and did not need Volumnius around trying to horn in on his glory. It was not explicit, but the implication was that the patrician Claudius did not need the assistance of a mere plebeian. Volumnius, offended by the reaction to what he thought was requested aid, said, fine, have it your way, and wheeled his army around. But the officers and men of Claudius's army blocked his path. Despite the vain assertions of their commander, they told Volumnius that the situation in Etruria was dire, and the presence of both armies was necessary for victory. Volumnius decided to put it to a vote of the legions, who, by loud acclaim, demanded he stay. Claudius was nonplussed, but was a savvy enough politician not to fly in the face of resounding popular opinion, and agreed to fight with Volumnius by his side. The united legions then rushed out to find the mixed Etruscan and Samnite army. The resulting battle was an ill-organized and sloppy affair on both sides. The general of the Samnites wasn't even present, so the Samnites were completely disorganized in their deployment, and the Roman legions with their commanders at odds with one another and hasty in their search for a fight, 
just charged into the fray without any plan at all. But in spite of this, the Romans prevailed, scattering the Etruscans and leaving the Samnite army in disarray. However, this victory did not end the danger. The next year, 295, the Samnite army regrouped and the Etruscan communities committed fresh troops to the struggle. In addition, the Umbrians, a hill tribe from the northern Apennines, officially joined the coalition against the Romans, and, in a surprise development, Gallic tribes that had settled in the Po Valley allowed their services to be bought by the rich Etruscans, swelling the size and strength of the army Rome would soon face. The armies of these four races gathered near Clusium in northern Etruria to plan their next move. In Rome, consular elections were held, and despite his renewed protest, Marcus Valerius was returned once again. This time he bowed to public pressure and agreed to serve. His only stipulation was that Publius Decius be made his colleague. The two had been partners in the consulship twice before, and had served together as censors. There were obvious tactical disadvantages to having consuls at odds with one another, as Claudius and Volumnius had proven, and Marcus Valerius wanted to make sure that there was harmony at the top as Rome went off to challenge the largest and most dangerous enemy it had ever faced. The people agreed with this logic and returned Decius. However, despite their previous excellent working relationship, things immediately got off on the wrong foot. The Senate wanted to assign Marcus Valerius to Etruria without the traditional drawing of lots. Decius protested, saying that he had no problem being sent to Samnium to lead the war on a quiet front, but he would not do so arbitrarily because Marcus Valerius, a patrician, was considered better suited for the greater danger that lay in Etruria. He demanded that lots be drawn and let the chips fall where they may. Marcus Valerius, for his part, exacerbated the situation by accepting command in Etruria and, in fact, claiming it as his right. If it had not been for his bold decision to enter the Cimmerian forest and secure the natives as allies of Rome, the legions would not have the supply routes needed to enable a major campaign in Etruria in the first place. He considered Etruria to be his country and wanted to finish the job he had started. A heated exchange of words followed, but in the end, precedent gave way to popular pressure, and Marcus Valerius led his legions into Etruria without lots being drawn. However, after the Senate began to read Marcus Valerius's reports of the massive army gathering and hearing Appius Claudius describe the desperate situation he had just left, they recalled Decius from Samnium and asked him to join Valerius in Etruria. Every enemy of Rome was gathered in the north, and the Romans absolutely, positively, had to win the upcoming battle if they were to have any peace at all in the future. So Decius marched with his armies north, leaving a token force to watch over the non-combatant Samnites. Marcus Valerius was a far more practical man than Claudius, and when he saw Decius approaching, he welcomed him with open arms. Glory could only be had in victory, and the size of the anti-Roman coalition army was drastically reducing the odds of victory. But joined together, the legions would be more than a match for this formidable enemy. The two armies met near Sentinum and set up camp across from one another on a plain. Deserters from the Gallic camp brought the consuls word of the coalition's plan. They had decided that the Gauls and Samnites would fight Rome on the battlefield, while the Etruscans and Umbrians overwhelmed the undermanned Roman camp. They hoped to catch the Romans without an exit strategy and crush them between the force of their four combined armies. But, now knowing the plan, the consuls immediately took measures to prevent its implementation. In a classic display of indirect strategy, a contingent of legionaries was ordered out into the Etruscan countryside to attack and burn at will any house, community, town, or field they encountered. This devastation could not be tolerated by the Etruscans, who broke camp and made off to protect their homes. Having now peeled off at least a fourth of the opposing forces and throwing a wrench in the coalition plan, the Romans immediately sought a battle, which the remaining Samnites, Umbrians, and Gauls welcomed, abandoning their dual attack strategy for one all-out attack. They were confident of victory. Today would be the day they broke Rome and lifted its oppressive yoke from the back of Italy. That was the plan, anyway. The Battle of Sentinum was the largest ever fought in Italy to that date. 
Both sides fielded armies upwards of 40,000 men, with allies and cavalry included. On the Roman side, Decius commanded the left flank against the Gauls, while Marcus Valerius took the right against the Samnites. Though united in purpose, they took very different approaches. Valerius felt that Rome's strength lay in its discipline and endurance, that the Gauls and Samnites started strong but faded down the stretch. He took a conservative approach, holding against Samnite rushes, but not pressing the advantage or taking risks. Once they tired, though, he planned on crushing them. Decius, however, the junior partner, had no such patience. He wanted to meet strength with strength and push back with everything he had against the Gauls. When they began to falter, Decius decided to win the battle early and decisively, but in his haste for glory, he sealed his own fate. He led a bold cavalry charge into the heart of the Gallic line, but, rather than breaking them, he found his own forces scattered and killed, and when the cavalry wheeled around to escape the Gallic attack, they charged headlong into the front lines of the Roman infantry, crushing under hoof many of their own men. The Roman left was in complete disarray and began to panic and flee. Decius, however, recognizing his folly, and here we are moving into romantic, vivid Roman storytelling, knew what he had to do. He called a priest and declared that as his father had sacrificed himself to ensure victory, so too would he to atone for his folly. He anointed himself and, wrapped in a ceremonial robe, followed his father into the underworld. Seeing their commander's sacrifice, the Roman left rallied and charged the Gauls. On the right, Marcus Valerius's plan was about to come to fruition. He saw that the spears were thrown with a little less force and a little more aimlessly. He ordered his cavalry in middle line around to the right and pressed the Samnite flank. When they turned, Valerius ordered his main line to charge ahead and take no prisoners. The Samnites could not long endure the dual front, and finally, after a full day's fighting, they broke and fled. The Gauls, along with the Umbrian forces, were now pinned between two armies and, recognizing the fight was lost, followed the Samnites into the Etruscan countryside. The Romans had faced a combined army of the four strongest tribes in Italy and emerged victorious. The peninsula was now Rome's and would remain so for the next 800 years. The war against the Samnites would carry on for another five years, but at Sentinum, the fate of Italy was sealed. A final clash between the Romans and Samnites was fought at Aquilonia in 293 BC, with the Romans completely dominating an enemy that had once been more than equal to Roman strength. The Samnites were beaten, finally and completely, and the five decades long struggle came to an end. But though they could no longer muster the force necessary to resist Roman domination, Samnite resentment never died. Two hundred years later, the Samnites would be at the center of the social war, an Italian revolt against Roman discrimination. In that war, they were the first to take the field and the last to surrender. But that story is for another day. Next week we will turn our attention south. The new Roman dream of an Italian empire was fast becoming a reality, and the only thing that stood in their way now was the Greek cities of Magna Graecia. The time had come for the independent city-states in the south to recognize a new master, though subduing the Greeks would be no easy task. They were as skilled at war as the Romans and had the resources of Greece to support them in their struggle, and one general in particular, Pyrrhus of Epirus, a relative of Alexander the Great, to lead them. Greece was fresh off conquering half the world under Alexander and was the premier civilization of its day. This would be the first in a series of clashes between the upstart Romans and the long-established Greeks that would mark the transition from Greek to Roman dominance in the Mediterranean. Though when Pyrrhus climbed aboard his ship to sail for Italy, he knew none of this. He thought he was off to put down some barbaric rabble and maybe get rich. But he had no idea what he was up against.
and welcome to the history of Rome. After defeating the Etruscans in the north and the Samnites in the east, the Romans now looked to Magna Graecia in the south for fresh conquests. All that stood between Rome and an Italian-wide empire was the fiercely independent and disunited Greek cities. Despite the collective threat they faced from Rome, the rivalry between the cities of Magna Graecia precluded any organized resistance. The Romans decided all they had to do was play the cities off one another, knowing they would have little trouble finding a few willing Greek accomplices who, in return for preferential treatment from their new Roman overlords, would aid Rome in subduing their Greek countrymen. But Roman plans were complicated by the introduction of an army from across the Adriatic led by the Greek king Pyrrhus. Answering calls for aid against the Romans, Pyrrhus had dreams of an Italian kingdom for himself, and though his dreams were ultimately foiled, the battles he fought against the Romans marked the opening salvo in a struggle between the Roman West and the Greek East that would end a hundred years later with a bewildered Greek nation kneeling before their new Roman masters. Prior to the invasion by Pyrrhus, the eastern and western Mediterranean had, for the most part, been completely separate from one another. Divided roughly by the Adriatic and Ionian seas, the two halves had, politically at least, developed independently. Greek attention had always faced east and been consumed by its rivalry with Persia when it wasn't consumed with battling endlessly within itself. There were, of course, Greeks who had migrated west to the south of Italy and Sicily, but once their cities were founded, it was like they lived in a different world. There was no attempt from the motherland to control them and no involvement by the Italian colonies in persistent internal Greek squabbles. The only major historical overlap was the Athenian invasion of Sicily during the Peloponnesian War in 415 BC. The expedition had ended so disastrously for the Athenians, many point to it as the principal reason Athens ultimately lost that war, that the thought of going west filled the Greeks with prudent revulsion for generations. They had enough to deal with in the east without courting disaster in the west. When Alexander ascended to the throne in 338 BC, all of his ambition lay east with the conquest of Persia and beyond. It has long been a source of speculation how different things would have turned out had Alexander turned west and faced the nascent Roman Empire rather than going east to fight the Persians. It was only 650 miles from Athens to Rome, and Alexander, who marched 3,000 miles to India undefeated, could have taken Italy almost as an afterthought. But the Romans were granted a stay of execution, and the greatest general in the ancient world marched his armies east, all the way to India, allowing Rome to continue to gather its strength unmolested. Forty years of war, shifting alliances, and rivalries between Alexander's generals had followed his death in 323 BC. But by 280, things had fairly well settled themselves, so that when a Greek commander finally did look west with ambition, it was only because of the limited opportunities for conquest in the post-Alexandrian eastern Mediterranean. That commander, Pyrrhus of Epirus, was born in 318 BC, right into the middle of the post-Alexandrian struggle. He was a prince of Epirus, a kingdom located in what is today the Balkans, on the periphery of the Greek world. He was a second cousin of Alexander, and found himself caught up in the volatile post-Alexandrian battles for control of Greece, Egypt, and Persia. His father was dethroned when Pyrrhus was only two, and the family was forced into exile. At sixteen, his father now dead, Pyrrhus was returned to the throne of Epirus by the powerful king his family had taken refuge with, but a year later he was deposed. Through marriage, Pyrrhus managed to gain some powerful friends while enduring his second exile. Taking a daughter of Ptolemy as his wife and marrying his sister to Demetrius, the reigning king of Macedon. With these new allies, Pyrrhus regained the throne of Epirus. A few years later, his sister dead, Pyrrhus turned on his ex-brother-in-law, conquering Macedon and proclaiming himself king. His reign over Alexander's homeland was brief, however, and he was driven back to Epirus in 284 BC. By this time, the situation in the east had begun to solidify. What had once been Alexander's empire was now divided into three major kingdoms. Antigonid Greece and Macedon, Seleucid Persia and Asia Minor, and Ptolemaic Egypt. There was little room here for an ambitious 34-year-old leader of a minor Greek kingdom. When then, in 282 BC, 
Tarentum, one of the leading cities of Magna Graecia, sent envoys into Greece begging for aid against Roman encroachment, Pyrrhus leapt at the opportunity. The major powers disdained to get involved, but Pyrrhus saw a chance for glory. There may not be room for him in the east, but there was abundant space for a savvy general to acquire a rich and powerful empire in the west. Pyrrhus nobly answered the call for aid and readied his army of 25,000 to sail to the rescue of his besieged countrymen, who would soon, hopefully, also be his subjects. Tarentum had run afoul of Rome because Rome had run afoul of Tarentum. The Romans had formed an alliance with the minor city of Thurii, and when their new allies were threatened, Rome offered assistance. This annoyed the Tarentines, who considered internal Greek matters to be their domain. They were further incensed when a small Roman fleet, sent to garrison Thurii, was blown off course and ended up in Tarentine waters. A clear violation of a standing treaty between Rome and Tarentum. The Tarentines attacked the Roman fleet and sunk a number of the errant ships. So now it was Rome's turn to be incensed, and envoys were sent to Tarentum to demand an apology. The Tarentines, however, greeted the envoys rudely and sent them packing to a chorus of insults. Rome needed no further provocation, and in 282 BC, war was immediately declared. Before aid could arrive from Greece, though, the Romans sacked Tarentum and had begun negotiations of peace with its aristocratic party, who favored an alliance with Rome. An advanced party from Epirus, however, arrived in 281 BC, just as the papers were being signed and drove the Romans out. In 280, Pyrrhus arrived with his full army, including 4,000 cavalry and 20 war elephants. They landed in Italy without opposition, and the Greek king began to lay plans for the systematic conquest of the peninsula. But the Romans, who had just recently secured Italy for themselves, were in no mood to give it up easily. The Romans sent an army eight legions strong south to deal with this invading army, and met Pyrrhus near Heraclea, a Greek city located on the instep of the Italian boot. Pyrrhus was confident of victory, but began to have doubts as he watched the Romans methodically build their fortified camps. This was not the barbarian horde the Tarentines had described. It was an organized and disciplined army of a civilized society. Mildly worried, but undeterred, Pyrrhus led his army out into the field. The disciplined Greek phalanx was more than a match for the Romans, and Pyrrhus's army soon gained the upper hand. But the Romans were stubborn in defeat, and the battle took its toll on the Greek army. Pyrrhus lost 4,000 of his best troops, and watched with consternation as the Romans, far from breaking and fleeing in panic, withdrew in an orderly fashion back to their camp. This was not going to be as easy as he thought. The Battle of Heraclea was important for two reasons. First, it was the first time the newly reformed Manipal legions had faced the might of a full Greek phalanx. True, the legions had lost, but the fight was by no means lopsided. Second, it was also the first time the Romans faced war elephants. The Roman cavalry was terrified by the huge beasts, and the presence of the elephants played a major role in tipping the battle in Pyrrhus's favor. The Romans would learn from their defeat and craft new ways to attack the phalanx and tactics to deal with the hitherto unknown elephant. Tactics that would come into play when Hannibal deployed them time and again against the Romans in the Second Punic War. The Romans next met Pyrrhus further north at Ascalum, on the east side of the Apennines. By this time Pyrrhus had reinforced himself with some new Italian allies, most notably a collection of Samnite tribes, but the Greek king was disappointed by his inability to peel off more Italian allies from Rome. The Romans had done much to shore up their alliances, and Pyrrhus's plan of turning the Italians en masse against Rome was not coming to fruition easily. When the two sides met near Ascalon, they fielded equal armies of about 40,000. The Romans were led by Publius Decius, son of the hero of the Third Samnite War and grandson of the hero of the First Samnite War who brought with him new devices to deal with the war elephants, including chariots that would circle the legs of the huge beast with rope and bring them crashing down. It was the same tactic that had served the rebel alliance so well against the imperial walkers during the battle for Hoth. The first day of the battle ended in a stalemate. 
The Greek forces broke the legions they faced on the left wing, but the Romans defeated the Samnite and Tarentine forces in the center. Pyrrhus tried to press his advantage on the wing, but the beaten Romans retreated up a steep hill, too steep for the Greek phalanx to follow. Raining projectiles down, the Romans forced Pyrrhus to withdraw, and the day ended with neither side holding the advantage. The next day, Pyrrhus ordered his men to hold the steep ground, and they forced the Romans into the flat, open plain. This time, his elephants overwhelmed the Roman line, and they broke. Pyrrhus had won again, but the battle had been costly, and many of his best officers had fallen. Congratulated on his triumph, Pyrrhus famously commented, One more such victory, and we are undone. Giving rise to the expression, Pyrrhic victory, to describe a costly success. Worn down by fighting the Romans, Pyrrhus offered terms of peace, but was rebuffed by the Roman Senate. They were persuaded by the old, and by now truly blind, Appius Claudius, to deny any treaty with a foreign army while it remained on Italian soil. At this point, Pyrrhus was in quite a bind, for the Romans had just concluded a new treaty with the Carthaginians, and now the true great powers of the western Mediterranean would not be turned against one another. So Pyrrhus decided to move on from Italy. It had, after all, been his plan all along to use Italian bases as a springboard for the real prize, Sicily. He was allowing himself to get bogged down with preliminary and unnecessary fighting. He did not need the Italian bases, they just would have been nice. His ego-saving rationalizations thus complete, Pyrrhus left Italy and sailed for Sicily in 278 BC. At this point, Sicily was divided between the Carthaginians who held the west and the Greeks who held the east. Upon hearing the news of Pyrrhus's imminent invasion, the Carthaginians laid siege to Syracuse, the most important Greek city on the island, and attempted to capture it before Pyrrhus arrived. But they were unsuccessful and were driven off when Pyrrhus landed. The Greek king claimed Syracuse as his own and led the grateful Greeks against the Carthaginians, who were pressed back until they held a single city on the west coast. The Carthaginians offered to relinquish claims to the rest of Sicily as long as they were allowed to hold the one port, but Pyrrhus, confident in final victory, refused the offer. But unable to dislodge the Carthaginians from their stronghold, he decided to attack the North African mother city directly. He ordered the Sicilians to raise an army and build him a fleet for the invasion. But the locals had by this time grown tired of Pyrrhus's dictatorial style and refused. The strength of his army sat by the campaigns in Italy and Sicily, and his rear guard pressed hard by the Romans. Pyrrhus decided to return to the mainland, lest he find himself trapped on the island by the Carthaginian fleet. He would consolidate his holdings in Italy and return to Sicily with a large enough army to drive out the Carthaginians once and for all. So in 275 BC, he returned to Italy and immediately faced a Roman army determined to drive the Greek invader off. They faced each other near Maleventum, and, once again, Pyrrhus's army defeated the legions, but this time, Roman fire arrows had sent the war elephants crashing through Pyrrhus's own line, wrecking havoc and killing a good chunk of his infantry. By now the casualties had mounted up, and Pyrrhus, at his wit's end, decided he had had enough of Italy. He gathered up what was left of his army and sailed back to Epirus. Never had a general won so many battles with so little to show for it. The Romans, delighting in their non-victory victory, renamed Maleventum Beneventum, changing it from the place of bad events to the place of good events. Pyrrhus left behind a garrison in Tarentum, but the Romans quickly overran the outnumbered Greeks and in short order had solidified their hold on Magna Graecia. The Romans now controlled the entire peninsula and had proven themselves to be an emerging power in pan-Mediterranean politics. The East began to wake up to the threat that was rising from Italy. As long as the Romans were confined to the peninsula, the balance of power that had settled in the post-Alexandrian world would hold. But if this new Roman force, which had just driven off a more than able Greek army, led by a man widely considered to be the best general of his generation, decided to expand its horizons, it spelled nothing but trouble for the old powers. The Roman capture of Magna Graecia represented not just another step in Roman expansion. 
It also effectively brought to a close the era of the city-state in the ancient world. The polity that Plato and Aristotle had held as the ideal form of government was now a thing of the past. The Macedonian conquest of Greece had already ended forever the existence of the independent city-state there, but it had survived in the Greek colonies of Magna Graecia. Now, though, the subjugation by Rome ended any official autonomy for the Greek city-states of Italy, and henceforth politics and government in the ancient world would move permanently into the hands of large empires. The only true holdout was Syracuse, which managed to survive more or less independently until the end of the Second Punic War, but its longevity was only secured by a close personal alliance between Hiero, the king of Syracuse, and Rome. Had Hiero been less of a friend to Rome, Syracuse would have fallen long before it did. The city-state as a political institution was effectively dead, and Rome had dealt the killing stroke. As for Pyrrhus, he never got the chance to avenge his losses in Italy, and was allegedly killed in 272 BC while fighting in the Greek city of Argos by a tile thrown from a rooftop by an Argiad woman. He never won the empire he sought, and his main legacy lay in teaching the Romans how to effectively battle a Greek army and introducing them to war elephants. The Romans, always adapting their techniques, would apply what they'd learned a hundred years later when they again met the Greeks in battle though the tables would be turned the next time they met, and it would be the Greeks' turn to lose to an invading Roman army, though the Roman victories were far from Pyrrhic, and Greece was conquered easily. Next week, we will take a break from the narrative and jump ahead so that I may present the History of Rome Christmas special. As Rome transitioned from pagan to Christian in the 300s AD, the Emperor Constantine introduced a number of edicts that ensured the success of the conversion including the eventual choice of December the 25th as the birth date of Jesus. It is a fascinating and still relevant story, and I can't let the occasion pass without telling it. After that, we will be on hiatus for a week, but return after the new year fresh, recharged, and ready to pile headlong into the Punic Wars, the most important conflict in the long history of Rome.